So this is a three-week course. Last week we talked about Marcion, the, the earliest arch heretic of the church, where he argued that there's not one God but two gods. The God of the Old Testament was an evil God. Jesus is the good God. And the Old Testament is not scripture. It just tells you about how evil the God of Israel is. Uh, so we talked about who he was and talked about ways of responding to Marcion. And so this week we'll talk about the Council of Nicaea, what it got right and wrong. Next week we will talk about post supersessionist theology. So theologies that attempt to correct the error of replacement theology, the idea that the church has replaced Israel as God's chosen people. And so the, the point that I'd like to make with the, this collection of uh, presentations is that while the church is imperfect and has made tragic mistakes throughout its history, we should appreciate the church for upholding the Tanakh and the whole New Testament as scripture, so we talked about last week, for defending the deity of Yeshua for millennia, that's what we'll spend a good amount of time talking about this week, and working on correcting replacement theology, which will be next week. So again, uh, this is a new topic for me. It's not my wheelhouse, uh, so uh, if you want to double check me on anything I'm saying, here are some of the sources that I relied on. Um, and if, if you want any more than that, because of your own curiosities, I can send you a list with a, with a few more that I relied on for this presentation. So before we talk about what did happen at the Council of Nicaea, let's talk about what did not happen. So the church did not invent the Trinity at the Council. Uh, the Trinity was not invented by anyone. Uh, the word Trinity uh, developed to label the doctrine that describes God's triune nature, which says God is one in essence and three in persons. We'll repeat, we'll repeat that a few times throughout this uh, presentation, which is a doctrine that was not invented, but it is the best description of the biblical data regarding how the scriptures describe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as one God who exists in three co-equal, co-eternal, consubstantial, yet distinct persons. If that sounds complicated, it is complicated. So you're, you're right on track. Uh, so then uh, the church uh, did not decide Yeshua is divine at the council. It was already a widespread uh, accepted belief that Yeshua is the second person of the Trinity by the time the Council of Nicaea took place. Uh, we'll talk about more about this more, but the Council of Nicaea was provoked by a powerful heresy that was taking place that just provoked the church to go ahead and articulate uh, Yeshua's divinity in precise terms officially. Then also the church did not debate and decide the books of the Bible. The canon was not under any discussion at the Council of Nicaea. So this is probably the most common myth that's uh, floating around about the Council of Nicaea, that this is when the church decided the books of the Bible. Uh, this was nowhere part of the council. By this time, uh, the books of the New Testament were already recognized as scripture, and it was not a controversial con conversation. Also, uh, Constantine did not make Christianity the official religion of Rome at the Council of Nicaea. In fact, he never did this. What he did was he legalized Christianity. So it wasn't until Emperor Theodosius, uh, a few decades later, where he made Christianity the official religion of Rome. And then finally, Constantine did not change Shabbat from Saturday to Sunday at the Council of Nicaea. So those are some popular myths uh, about what happened at the Council, uh, but none of those things happened uh, at the Council. And we'll talk more about what, what did happen. Uh, so again, just like uh, last week, we'll talk about the historical context, just to kind of ground it and frame it in our minds a little bit. So Yeshua's death and resurrection happened in 30 CE. The destruction of this temple uh, was 70 CE. The completion of all New Testament texts is by about 90 CE, uh, Revelation and John most likely being the, the last ones written. Then set the second Jewish revolt in 132. And then, as we talked about last week, the rise of Marcionism in 140 CE, and then Tertullian writing against Marcion in 200, and then uh, there's brutal persecution of Christians under Emperor Diocletian from 284 to about 305, so he's the emperor that directly preceded um, Constantine. Constantine rises to power in Rome in 306 CE, 
And then the Edict of Milan grants Christians religious freedom in the Roman Empire in 313 CE. And so that's what Constantine did. And so also just to give this a little bit more of a, of a framework, uh, so the Council of Nicaea took place in 325 CE, so 295 years after the resurrection. So just for context, July 4th, 1776, the day America declared independence uh, from Britain was 248 years ago. So we haven't even reached the distance uh, that was between the resurrection and uh, the Council of Nicaea. So this was uh, quite a bit, quite a bit after uh, the resurrection. The church had quite a bit of time to develop and to uh, accumulate a, uh, a unity on, on a lot of views informally, and the council gave them an opportunity to do it formally. And actually, next year will mark the 1700th anniversary of the Council of Nicaea. So it was a long time ago. All right, so now Emperor Constantine. He was the first Christian emperor of Rome from 306 to 337 CE. He allegedly converted to Christianity after having a vision of Christ, I'll use his language, of Christ who commanded him to emblazon uh, the Greek letters chai and rho, they look like X and P, which were the first two letters of Christ in Greek, on his soldiers' shields. According to Eusebius, a church historian, Christ told Constantine, in hoc signo vinces, in this sign, conquer. So it was really at this moment where the symbols of Christianity took a political and uh, violent character. Uh, this was possibly a politically expedient conversion by Constantine. Uh, perhaps he was noticing uh, the Christian influence throughout the empire, and he kind of read the tea leaves that this was the direction the empire was headed, and so he uh, hopped on that train, uh, potentially. Um, one of the reasons why some people uh, may be cast doubt on how genuine his conversion was was because he continued to offer pagan sacrifices as the emperor of Rome, and he issued coins with himself alongside Sol Invictus, uh, a Greek god. Um, so, but some historians kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. It's like, look, he's the first Christian emperor in history. Emperors, they had a requirement to participate in pagan temples. Like, let's come some slack. Like, he had to figure things out. Um, but, you know, you can take it for what you will. You can make your own speculations about it. Um, he did support building churches and promoted Christianity uh, all throughout the empire. So uh, it was really in 306, uh, or 312 rather, uh, where he um, conquered Maxentius. He was one of the tetrarchs of Rome uh, at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, and that is what gave him sole role, uh, or sole rule over the Roman Empire, empire as, as Caesar. And so this is an image from a 9th century Byzantine manuscript of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. So there we see Constantine on the left and the symbol that he saw in, his, in the vision in the sky and the bridge and then Maxentius's army uh, fleeing. And here's another image where uh, perhaps you could see on the red shields on the right side of uh, the image, the, the high and the row on the shields um, for the symbol of, of Christ. And there you see the Milvian Bridge in the, in the background. And here is a picture of the Milvian Bridge which still stands uh, in Rome uh, to cross the, the Tiber River. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, that's still there and uh, can be visited. And then here's an image of the coin with Constantine in the front as Caesar. It was Sol Invictus. Uh, in, in the background uh, there, uh, which was a common thing to do for emperors to do, um, but this is one of the reasons why um, some scholars cast doubt on how genuine his uh, conversion to Christianity was. Uh, but Constantine kind of is this lurking figure in the background of the Council of Nicaea, especially as myths and legends grow, uh, so there's this question of how big of a role did he actually play in the council. At least according to David Wilhite, uh, he says, to his credit, after Constantine convened the council, he deferred to the bishops themselves and allowed them to proceed largely without his interference. It must have been surprising to the Arian party, who had Constantine's support going into the council, when Constantine allowed the anti-Arian party to win the debate. 
So if it seemed like Constantine was actually kind of sympathetic to the Arian view, which was determined to be a heresy after the Council of Nicaea. So if Constantine uh, was in a position or had the desire to tip the scales, um, presumably it would have been in favor of the Arian party. Uh, but it seems like Constantine, at the end of the day, just wanted unity. He just wanted a, de a decision to be made one way or, or the other. That was his uh, main goal in calling for, for the conference. Uh, so despite his apparent uh, lack of influence in the council, uh, we will see that he did write some letters before and after the council that showed his personal attitude about what was being discussed and some of the rulings that were made at the council. Uh, nonetheless, what this did take or what this did do is it took a big step in accomplishing uh, marrying church uh, to state power. Constantine's calling for the bishops to meet and being there uh, at the council, uh, wanting a decision on, on religious matters uh, to be made within the church. All right, so now the Council of Nicaea itself. Uh, so as we said, 325 CE, uh, Nicaea is in Asia Minor, uh, so in modern day Turkey, uh, somewhat near uh, Sinope, where, where Marcion uh, is from, as we'll see on the map. There were about 300 bishops present. Tradition says 318, uh, with nearly 1,800 invited. Uh, they were all called for by Emperor Constantine. He's the one who called for the council, again, in, in seeking uh, unity, because this heresy, this Aaron heresy, was growing to influence the church, uh, enough to the point where it was causing a bit of a division, and so he just wanted unity and strength uh, in the church. And the Council of Nicaea is the first of the first four ecumenical councils that are recognized by nearly every church denomination uh, with varying degrees of explicit adherence. So obviously a church like the Roman Catholic Church or the uh, Greek Orthodox Church, um, they have very explicit and frequent uh, recitations of uh, the Nicene Creed and other creeds that were developed uh, at these councils in references to these, these councils and in reliance on these councils, uh, whereas kind of low, low church, like evangelical, fundamental uh, dom denominations, they'll agree with the theology that was articulated at these councils, but they won't recite the Nicene Creed, uh, for example, somewhat in an anti-Catholic uh, bias uh, kind of uh, move. So the other three, uh, that are worth mentioning, uh, is the First Council of Constantinople in 381, uh, which is actually where the Nicene Creed took a fuller form. So we'll see that there was a creed that was uh, uh, written at the Council of Nicaea, but really it's the one formulated at the Council of Constantinople that is really the basis of what we have uh, today. And then the, there's the First Council of Ephesus in 431, where they talked more about the nitty-gritty of Yeshua's humanity and divinity. Uh, how do those two things fit together in the person of Yeshua? And they established that the Messiah is one person with two natures, so one divine nature and one human nature. And then in 451 CE, there was the Council of Chalcedon, where they formulated the Chalcedonian definition, uh, which just further articulated uh, what the Council of Ephesus was uh, describing. So a somewhat summary of the Chalcedonian definition says that Messiah is truly God and the Messiah is truly human. And then quoting Carl Truman, a church historian, uh, I think he's Presbyterian, he says, the two natures, human nature and divine nature, must not be so mixed together that either disappears into the other or that third hybrid nature is produced and the two natures must not be separated so as to undermine the unity of the one person. So again, that's complicated. I just wanted to let your ears hear it. Um, it, it was a long time uh, before I even heard uh, such articulations of uh, who Yeshua is and how his divine nature and human nature work. So it's not going to be what we spend a lot of time explaining tonight, but it is a good moment just to share it. And um, if you want to look into it, Chalcedonian definition is uh, the place to go. All right, so here is where Nicaea is, uh, very close to Constantinople, um, right near the, the Black Sea and the Aegean Sea uh, in North Asia Minor. Uh, one scholar said that the reason why it happened at Nicaea 
is because Constantine had a vacation home there, and he was going to be there at the time of the meeting, and so he was like, all right, we're going to meet here uh, so I can attend while I'm uh, at my vacation home. And then zooming out a little bit, here is Nicaea in relation to where Rome is there on the far left of the screen. So almost directly west uh, is Rome, Italy. All right, so what provoked the council? I've already shared, uh, but what I think might get lost is the message of Jewish circles. We tend to focus on uh, the disconnection that happens uh, between Easter and Passover uh, at the Council of Nicaea. This was not the main issue at the council. Yes, there was a desire to disconnect what they would have called Pasha from Passover, uh, but it was not the main motivation for it to convene the council. It was about uh, the Arian controversy and, and who uh, Yeshua was, who, who Jesus is. And so I'm going to try to stick to the word Pasha for historical, a uh, closer historical accuracy. Uh, Pasha is from the Greek word uh, Pascha, so you just kind of add the chai uh, pronunciation, which is based on the Aramaic word that pretty much sounds the same, which is based on the Hebrew word Pesach, which we're all familiar with. Um, Pasha is only referred to as Easter in Germanic languages and did not start being referred to as Easter until centuries later. Uh, so there's even some uh, very late, like 14, 1500s, uh, German and English dictionaries and books where it uses Easter and Pasha like interchangeably. Um, and so you will see some English translations of ancient texts that I quote that where I will read the word Easter, but the Greek word behind it is Pascha or Pasha. Um, and so the languages, but then even today, uh, Christians whose language are based on Latin or Greek use a version of Pasha today. They don't call it Easter, but they call it Pasha, which is very close to uh, the Hebrew basis of that Pesach. And so just to, to quickly address another uh, myth, I think, is that just because Easter sounds like Ishtar, uh, a, a Greek goddess in the ancient world, it does not mean it was meant to embody a pagan goddess in the name. So just because it's called Easter, it doesn't mean it's a pagan holiday. Uh, just because it sounded, it sounds somewhat like Ishtar. Uh, after all, Esther sounds even more like Ishtar. Uh, but that doesn't mean Esther is based off of Ishtar either, which some people are actually trying to make that case uh, based off of the same logic as people use it for Easter. Others say Easter is based on the pagan goddess Hostera, but we only have one record of this goddess in all our uh, historical records. So scholars tend to think that Hostera was likely made up or the author was confused about it. Um, it was mentioned by a I think ninth, eighth or ninth century Christian author. Uh, so Easter came to be in uh, Germanic languages because Pasha occurred in the fourth month of the old English calendar. I'm gonna not pronounce this very well, but at Ostormanoth. And so over the evolution of language that turned in, in, and as it evolved also through English, that turned into Easter. So it was just the month that Pasha was occurring on the Old English calendar. So Easter uh, is not pagan, uh, especially the name. Uh, if, if that interests you, uh, there's a really good, this is one of the videos that he does, uh, but he has a really good series on this. Uh, it's Inspiring Philosophy. Uh, he's on YouTube. He does a really good job looking at primary sources and uh, reading that. Yeah, go ahead and snap a picture. If you're curious about it. So then also we actually have the privilege of having Inspiring Philosophy on Two Messian Jews uh, to talk about Christmas, where he does a really good job of explaining how Christmas is not pagan either. Uh, not even the origins of Christmas uh, are pagan. So he does a really good job with that. And he also has his own series on his channel talking about Christmas uh, as well. So I recommend recommend both of those series. All right, so this disconnection of Pasha from Passover. Until about 190 CE, some Christians in the East commemorated Yeshua's crucifixion on Nisan 14, so in accordance with the Jewish calendar. These people were called Cordodecimans, uh, which meant the 14ers. 
And uh, the West commemorated, so the West being the Roman Catholics, uh, the West commemorated Yeshua's resurrection on the Sunday after Nisan 14, so still in accordance with the Jewish calendar. But then around 190 CE, the East and the West united on celebrating Pascha on the Sunday after Nisan 14. So they still depended on the Jewish calendar, and this Constantine did not like. So uh, let's take a look at some letters that he wrote uh, after the council uh, regarding his attitude towards um, this former connection with the Jewish calendar. So this is uh, Emperor Constantine's letter to all churches concerning the date of Pasha, and it is based off of uh, some ancient sources um, where we are able to reconstruct his letter. It says, at the council, we also considered the issue of our holiest day, Easter, Pasha, and it was determined by common consent that everyone everywhere should celebrate it on one and the same day. And in the first place, it seemed very unworthy for us to keep this most sacred feast following the custom of the Jews, a people who have soiled their hands in a most terrible outrage and have thus polluted their souls and are now deservedly blind. It's a very harsh Language, he goes on to say, since we have cast aside their way of calculating the date of the festival, we can ensure that future, future generations can celebrate this observance at the more accurate time, which we have kept from the first day of the Passion until the present time. Therefore, have nothing in common with that most hostile people, the Jews. We have received another way from the Savior. In our holy religion, we have set before us a course which is both valid and accurate. Let us unanimously pursue this. Let us, most honored brothers, withdraw ourselves from that detestable association. So uh, later on in the letter, he claims that Jewish people ridiculed Christians for having to rely on them to calculate the date for their holiest day of the year. So at least the way Constantine portrayed it in uh, very harsh and unnecessary terms is that because uh, the Jewish people ridiculed them, uh, they had to separate from this, and uh, he ratcheted the rhetoric way up in, in intense disrespect. So while that was Constantine's attitude, um, we don't have record, as far as I'm aware, of this attitude uh, taking, being part of the council's decision to disconnect the two. Um, from what I saw, which admittedly was limited, uh, the official uh, synodal letter Again, I don't know the pronunciation really of that term, uh, but a synod, a synod is a council of a Christian denomination, and it's essentially an assembly or a meeting. And this is from the sixth paragraph of a seven-paragraph letter written after the council. And it says, We further proclaim to you the good news of the agreement concerning the Holy Easter, that this particular also has, through your prayers, been rightly settled, so that all our brethren in the East who formerly followed the custom of the Jews are henceforth to celebrate the said most sacred feast of Easter at the same time with the Romans and yourselves and all those who have observed Easter from the beginning. So the rhetoric is absent in this letter, which is good, um, but it is hard to say um, what the attitude was of the bishops at the, the council. But from what I found, this is uh, how they chose to state it. So to give a little bit more detail into the result, um, one scholar uh, summarizes it in this way. So pretty much instead of observing it in accordance with Nisan 14, this is what they decided. Uh, it says, The full moon, which coincided with or fell next after the vernal equinox or the spring equinox, officially replaced Nisan 14 as the critical temporal reference point immediately preceding Easter Sunday. The Nicene resolution regarding the date of, Esther, of Easter was accepted in AD 341 as the first canon of the Synod of Antioch, and any Christian who thereupon did not accept it was automatically excommunicated. Cordodeciminism came to be defined as a strictly Jewish custom, it is within this spirit that Christian theologians would later claim that the observance of Nisan 14 did not oblige Christians since it was essentially a Jewish custom. So essentially what was decided is that on the first Sunday after the 
first full moon after the spring equinox, the church would celebrate Pascha, or Easter. Uh, and then today, the Western Easter is in accordance to that, uh, but then the Orthodox Easter, or the Greek Orthodox Easter, is the first Sunday after Passover, after the first full moon, after the vernal equinox, per the Julian calendar. So the, the Eastern Orthodox, or the Greek Orthodox Church, follows the Julian calendar, and the Roman Catholic Church follows the Gregorian. So if you have a, a Roman Catholic friend and a Greek Orthodox friend, they tend to celebrate Pascha or Easter about a month apart uh, for that reason. All right, so where this ruling was right was that non-Jews have no inherent obligation to celebrate anything on Nisan 14 or 16. That is true. Where this ruling was wrong is that the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox, is not the more correct, more accurate date of Yeshua's death and resurrection. It would have been Nisan 16, most likely. But I think that's okay. And I think it's okay because, like I said before, there is no commandment to have an annual church-wide celebration of Yeshua's death and resurrection on Nisan 14 or 16, so it's not like the church is neglecting to do something that they are commanded to do. Uh, and it is possible to have a genuine heartfelt celebration of an event uh, any day of the year, even if it is not exactly on the date of the commemorated event. And so this, we see this in the Bible itself, so Pesach Shani, so this, the second Passover, um, we, we read in Exodus that if anybody was unclean uh, during the time of the Passover celebration in Nisan, they had the opportunity to celebrate it a month later in the month of Iyar. So it wouldn't have been taking place on exactly the same day, but it was still a valid and genuine celebration and commemoration of the Exodus. And in fact, Jewish people are to remember the Exodus every day. And so most days, uh, the Jewish people are commemorating the Exodus, a very significant event, uh, not on the day that it actually occurred, which is okay. And then also on Shavuot, it's Jewish tradition to celebrate God giving the Torah, which is an amazing moment in the history of the world and especially the history of Israel. Um, but uh, there's no biblical data saying which day of the calendar uh, this happened. So uh, traditional Jews will rely on tradition found in the Talmud, but there's no biblical evidence for the day that they choose. Uh, but yet we celebrate God giving the Torah on Shavuot, and that's a good thing. It's worth uh, celebrating. And then also Sunday does make good symbolic and biblical sense uh, to celebrate the resurrection. We know when we, when we uh, read the Gospels that the tomb was discovered empty on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. And so while we have he uh, here at, and also in the Messianic Jewish community, uh, at large, no formal community-wide celebration of the resurrection on a Sunday, which is the day of the week Yeshua rose from the dead, we do celebrate the resurrection on Nisan 16, so the, the day on the calendar uh, when it occurred. But I think in this way, uh, we and the church actually complement each other really well. We do it on the calendar day that the resurrection occurred, and they do it on the day of the week that the resurrection occurred. I think both make sense. I think both are okay. And so uh, my take further is uh, if the various church denominations decide to change their tradition and celebrate Yeshua's crucifixion and resurrection on Nisan 14 or 16, Nisan 14 being the day of the crucifixion, uh, then that would be really remarkable. But otherwise, I'm not bothered by their traditions, even if Constantine or the bishops did not have good motives in originally separating the two. However, I do recognize that that is easy for me to say now in a world with Messianic Judaism where Jewish followers of Yeshua are able to express our Jewishness and faith in Yeshua simultaneously. Uh, this was a tragic moment in history for countless Jewish followers of Yeshua throughout the uh, centuries afterwards. Um, so I definitely uh, recognize that. All right, so now we will move on to uh, the main issue of the Council of Nicaea. So Arius, 
He is the main villain here painted uh, in church history. So he was an Alexandrian priest, so he was uh, ordained in the church. He lived uh, from 256 CE to 336 CE, and his heresy was called subordinationism. And so he taught that Yeshua is of a different substance or a different essence than God the Father. So the key Greek word there is heterousius, so of a different essence. He says that Yeshua is the second best God. He says Yeshua has divine attributes like omnipotence and omniscience, but is still less than God. These are things that God merely shared with Yeshua after God created Yeshua. And so because Yeshua is God's first creation, Yeshua is thus not eternal and is thus not God. Uh, his very famous and pithy phrase that uh, became widespread was, there was a time when the sun was not. And so apparently Arius was very uh, skilled at coming up with pithy slogans and even more songs that really popularized his view uh, throughout the Roman emperor empire. So he was a very uh, savvy communicator, uh, just like Marcion was. And so as this uh, teaching became widespread, um, Constantine did call for the Council of Nicaea because of the division it was causing. And in fact, it was in 318 where Arius kind of became known uh, because uh, Bishop the Bishop of Alexandria, Alexander, he was preaching a sermon and he was teaching Trinitarian concepts, uh, but Arius accused Alexander of heresy. And after this, approximately 100, the 100 bishops of Alexandria uh, excommunicated Arius from Alexandria in Egypt. Arius then found his way to Nicomedia, where he befriended a man named Eusebius of Nicomedia, who had connections to Constantine. So Arianism gained influence, and with his connection to Constantine, uh, that's why Constantine uh, called for the Ecumenical Council in Nicaea. Um, Arius made the right friends, and um, a lot was able to, to happen and, and had to be addressed because of Arius spreading his, his teaching. So two of Arius' favorite verses are John 3.16 and Colossians 1.15. So uh, what he wants to do with these two verses is show that God created Yeshua, that Yeshua is not eternal, that he is uh, a lower being than God is. And so we'll start with Colossians 1.15, uh, which is actually a bit of a, of a review from last week. Uh, so Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So here Arius would say, look, it's right there. Jesus was born. Just read the text literally. He was born before all other things were created, but nonetheless, he was created. He was born. So, same answer as last week. Does anybody happen to remember it? A little pop quiz? No? All right, you need to get my video, so again, give me your email afterwards, and I'll send it to you. So, for this, we can go to Psalm 89, 27. Uh, so what Psalm 89, 27 shows is that there is a figurative meaning to firstborn. Uh, so this is in reference to David. It says, and I will appoint him, David, to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. So we know this is not ta talking about David being the literal firstborn son of his family, because we know from 1 Chronicles 2, 13 through 14, that David was the seventh born son. And so here we can let context do the job for us and see that firstborn has this meaning of being essentially the king of kings, the highest of the kings, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. And this fits the context of Colossians 1, 15 very well. Uh, so the, to read the following verses, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, uh, the supreme leader, the king of all creation, for by him all things were created, not all other things, but all things were created in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen, whether thrones or angelic powers or rulers or authorities, all was created through him and for him. 
He exists before everything, and in him all holds together. So if Yeshua himself was a created thing, then we would expect a lot of others uh, in this passage. That for by him all other things were created, or in him holds all other things. Uh, because he would, have, he would be a thing too um, if he was created. But he was not. So Arius is trying to do the same thing with John 3.16. So this is the AKJV translation. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, monogenes is the Greek word for begotten there, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So Arius would say the same thing. See, Jesus was born. Just like every son from a father, he was created by God. And so we will do a move very similar. We'll look at the greater context of scripture, what other way can we understand monogenes? So we can turn to Hebrews eleven seventeen, which says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. So what, what do we notice about this? Was Isaac Abraham's only son? No. Of course, Abraham also had Ishmael. So we know that something figurative is going on here. So about this, the NET Bible commentary says this on monogenes. It says, although this word is often translated only begotten, such a translation is misleading since in English it appears to express a metaphysical relationship. The word in Greek was used of an only child, it was also used of something unique, only one of its kind. From here, it passes easily to a description of Isaac, uh, uh, citing Hebrews eleven seventeen, who was not Abraham's only son, but was one of a kind because he was the child of the promise. Thus, the word means one of a kind and is reserved for Jesus in the Johannine literature of the New Testament. While all Christians are children of God, Jesus is God's son in a unique, one-of-a-kind sense. The word is used in this way in all its uses in the Gospel of John. So it's not communicating uh, that Yeshua was born, that he was created, but that he is uniquely God's son in a way that no one else is God's son. And we'll talk more about that later. So the way the NET translates it is, for this is the way God loved the world, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So here is the creed of the Council of Nicaea, uh, which at the end here, they explicitly condemn Arius' teachings as heresy and as unacceptable for leaders in the church and members of the church. And so it says the Catholic, which just meant universal, and apostolic church condemns those who say concerning the Son of God that, quote, there was a time when he was not, or, quote, he did not exist before he was begotten, or, quote, he came to be from nothing, or who claim that he is of another subsistence, subsistence or essence or a creation or changeable or alterable. So here the uh, bishops at the Council of Nicaea did a really good job of protecting who Yeshua uh, is, de is depicted to be in the scriptures and condemn the heresy of Arianism. And so the paragraph prior is uh, really the beginnings of the Nicene Creed, uh, the things that are most notable to point out. In this case is that it introduces the word homoousian uh, when it says, uh, true God from true God begotten, not made of the same being, homoousian, or of the same essence as the Father. So Yeshua is of the same essence as the Father. They are both God. And so homoousian is in uh, distinction to uh, Arius' uh, heterousian, of a different essence or a different substance. And so here's an icon uh, from a monastery in Greece uh, that's depicting the Council of Nicaea. And there at the bottom in the shadows, you see Arian uh, or Arius being uh, condemned as, as the heretic uh, there. 
at the at the feet of all those at the at the council. So a couple modern Arians, uh, the Mormon Church and Jehovah's Witness, uh, they in their own ways depict and teach that Yeshua was created or at one time was not, and so uh, they could be described as modern Arians. And so um, if you ever get in a conversation with one, which odds are, you will. Um, so it's good to know where they're coming from and what they teach and understand about uh, Yeshua, about Jesus. It's definitely not uh, what, what we do. All right, so then here is the Nicene Creed, uh, which again uh, was formulated and uh, in, in a more full way in the uh, Council of Constantinople in 381. And uh, I'll just go ahead and read it. Uh, I'm just curious, has, it, has anybody here read the Nicene Creed before? A couple people? All right, yeah, then it's, I'll, I'll read it in full. Uh, it says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial, that's a Moosian word of the same essence, uh, with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Father, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So that is the Nicene Creed in its modern form. Uh, so I underlined there, and the Son. This is, was a subject of much controversy and debate in church history. It's referred to as the Filioque, which just means and the Son. Uh, so the Roman Catholic Church say, and this gets into really technical and philosophical theology, but again, it's just nice to kind of be aware of something. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church will say that the Holy Spirit uh, proceeds, so not created, uh, the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church affirm the Trinity, of course, so the Holy Spirit is also fully God. But to not get too deep in the ways of theology, it says that uh, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, is what the Roman Catholic Church would say. The Greek Orthodox Church would just say who proceeds from the Father. And so this is a, a point of tension uh, between the two, um, which is lessening, um, but that's called the filioque. And so there has been modifications over the years, which has caused uh, some controversies. Uh, but again, I just want to uh, reiterate that this is not the invention of the Trinity. This is simply the first official ecumenical articulation of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, Tertullian, who played a major role in stamping out Marcionism, as we talked about last week, over 100 years prior, he used the word Trinity, as did Hippolytus of Rome, in the third century. And Tertullian taught that there is one God who is three eternal persons. So the Nicene Creed articulating this, this is not like a brand new thing that they invented and came up with at the council under the intense watchful, watchful eye of, of Constantine. Uh, early on, Clement of Alexandria, Andri Clement of Alexandria also taught uh, Trinitarian theology. Uh, Tertullian is also the one who we have on record describing the father the Son, and the Holy Spirit as being homoousius, so of the same essence. So a lot of people credit Tertullian with providing that language. And there were many others who taught what amounted to uh, Trinitarian uh, doctrine prior to Nicaea, including as early as Justin Martyr in the middle of the second century, and Ignatius, Ignatius of Antioch in the early second century, only decades after the last New Testament books were written. And of course, we agree uh, with uh, these historical churches that this is, in fact, what the New Testament teaches. So, of course, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity 
does find its building blocks in the New Testament and in the whole Bible uh, itself, the Tanakh uh, included, we can make a case for the uh, doctrine of the Trinity. So about the Nicene Creed, uh, Rabbi Dr. Mark Kinzer is a Messianic Jewish scholar. He says this, he says, For some Messian Jews, one of the troubling elements of Christian history is Nicene Orthodoxy. However, unlike supersessionism, antinomianism, which is anti-Torah, anti-law, the Inquisition and the blood libel, it is inappropriate for us to ask our Christian partners to repent of the Nicene Creed. The Nicene consensus on Christology has endured over more than 16 centuries and continues to define the basic contours of Christian faith. The Christian Church, which is our partner, is a Nicene church. Bilateral ecclesiology calls us to a corporate commitment to this church. If this is the case, then we cannot dismiss the Nicene Creed in a cavalier fashion. This creed summarizes the essential and enduring teaching of our ecclesiological partner, and as a consequence, we must take it seriously and treat it with respect. The creed need not remain immune to all criticism, but it should always be given the benefit of the doubt. So like I mentioned, uh, there are some uh, low church uh, traditions uh, like evangelical or fundamental um, and others that uh, at least kind of shy away from the Nicene Creed, if not are hostile towards it, simply because it's tradition, uh, particularly Catholic tradition. Obviously, we know the Protestant traditions uh, came from protesting against the Catholic Church, so naturally they kind of possess an anti-Catholic bias. And uh, from a sociological perspective, we know that Messianic Judaism uh, kind of grew out of Protestant forms of Christianity. So in our history, we have kind of inherited a bit of that anti-Catholicism, anti-church tradition. Um, But I agree with uh, uh, Rabbi Kinzer here uh, that we need to uh, treat it with more respect and uh, with more um, attention. Of course, I'm not free from criticism, um, but concerning the fact that we do uh, wholeheartedly agree with the core teaching of the Nicene Creed, that of uh, the the Trinitarian doctrine, um, we we should approach it with more of a benefit of the doubt, uh, like he said, and with respect. Um, So, let's see. We'll do this kind of quickly. Again, if you have to leave at 8, that's okay. Um, But feel welcome to stick around. Uh, Let's talk about the Trinity itself. Hopefully, if I do a good job, uh, we can walk out of here with a little bit better of an understanding of the Trinity, which I always get a little nervous talking about because it's complicated, and I don't want to accidentally share with you uh, a heresy. (laughs) Uh, So I'll try my best. Uh, But but please uh, give me grace if if I don't do a good job. All right, so what is the Trinity? First, we'll talk about what the Trinity is not by way of some bad analogies that are common. Uh, So one is that the Trinity is like an egg. There's one egg, but there's a shell, the egg white, and the yolk. So it's three in one. So uh, this does not do a good job of explaining the Trinity uh, because what it does is it makes the Father one-third of God, the Son one-third of God, the Holy Spirit one-third of God, And if you just add up all the parts, it makes one God. But if you take one of those parts away, it's not God anymore. That's not what the Trinity teaches. So this is a heresy called partialism, that God is made up of three different parts. Three-leaf clover, this does the same thing. It's one clover with three leaves, it's three and one, it's like the Trinity. It's partialism as well. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are each just part of the clover. So that also fails. And then the Trinity is like H2O. It is liquid in one form, gas in another, and solid in another, but it's all H2O, so three in one. This does not explain the Trinity because the H2O cannot be solid, liquid, and gas all simultaneously, uh, which is key as part of the Trinity. So this is an analogy that corresponds with a heresy called modalism, that uh, God takes three different modes or forms, but it's not all at the same time. Uh, so that fails uh, the 
articulation of, of the Trinity. It does not capture the tr- doctrine of the Trinity well. Another one is that God takes on three different roles. Sometimes God acts as the Father, other times as the Son, other times as the Holy Spirit, just like a man who sometimes acts from his function as a father, other times as a son, and other times as a husband. Again, this uh, falls into modalism because a man is never acting at all three of those functions at the same time, uh, always. And so it is also another bad analogy for the Trinity. So the Trinity is not these modalistic or partialistic uh, analogies. So modalism, again, says the belief that God is one person who has revealed himself in three different modes or forms. Partialism, the belief that the Father is part of God, the Son is part of God, the Holy Spirit is part of God, who, when all together, are one God. So that is what the Trinity is not. At least for me, helping understand what it's not helps me better grasp what it is. And so this is a uh, common way to articulate the Trinity. Um, So what we believe is that in agreement with the historic Christian church, we believe God is one in essence and three co-equal and co-eternal persons who are of the same essence, yet distinct in their relationship with each other. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, in more simpler words, God is only one what, but three who's. Some people put it in the way of uh, God is one being uh, and has three consciousnesses, which that one may get a little bit into the weeds. Uh, I just stick with the technical language of God is one in essence and three co-equal and co-eternal persons who are the, the same essence. And so I avoid analogies uh, entirely uh, because analogies inevitably are using three-dimensional items in our world, Um, but God is above our three dimensions. So by definition, he'll never be able to be captured by an analogy. Um, So I don't even even try. Um, And so while you won't find the word Trinity in the Bible, nor this standard formulation of the doctrine of the Trinity explicitly stated in the Bible, Uh, This is the best way to capture the building blocks that are present in the Bible. And those building blocks are that the Bible teaches there is one God. Deuteronomy 4.35 is one example of that. God is three persons, Matthew 28.19, where it says to immerse uh, those in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three persons. But each person is fully God. So Malachi 2.10 teaches that the Father is God. 1 Corinthians 8.6 teaches Yeshua is God. Acts 5-4 through, through 4 teaches that the Holy Spirit is God. So for the sake of time, I will just skip to uh, Acts 5-4 through, through 4, because the Holy Spirit tends to be the more uh, difficult one to show. Um, there's less biblical data uh, for the Holy Spirit. So I'll just show this to you. It says, but Peter said, Ananias, who has Satan filled, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? You haven't lied to men, but to God. So, it said, so verse 3, it says, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Verse 4 says, you have lied to God. So Acts 5 is equating uh, the Holy Spirit and God. So the Holy Spirit is fully God, just as the Father is, just as the Son is. You can't lie to an impersonal force, which is how a lot of people imagine the Holy Spirit. You have to lie to a person. So the Holy Spirit is personal, just as the Father is, just as the Son is. And so one cool verse in the Tanakh is Isaiah 48, 12 through 16, uh, where it says, Listen to me, O Jacob, Israel, whom I summoned. I am the one. I am present at the very beginning and at the very end. Yes, my hand founded the earth. My right hand spread out the sky. I summon them. They stand together. So this I figure is creating. This I figure is very godlike. Approach me. Listen to this. From the very first, I have not spoken in secret. When it happens, I am there. So now the sovereign Lord has sent me 
accompanied by his spirit. So here in the Tanakh, we have a, uh, a, a verse that very much suggests the doctrine of the Trinity of these three divine persons, and obviously the Tanakh teaches that there is one God. Um, so the doctrine of the Trinity uh, helps us articulate that difficult thing to comprehend, which again, by definition, is difficult and impossible to fully comprehend. Why? Because we are human, we are limited, our minds are constrained severely. Of course, we're not going to fully comprehend the nature of God, who by definition is greater than we will ever understand. And so I actually think that's good evidence uh, that God is greater than us because if we can easily understand the nature of God, then that's not a very great God that's being uh, described. All right, so, so heading towards the conclusion here, I just wanted to point out uh, what I think is a profound complementary unity uh, that the Nicene Creed uh, has with us in Messianic Judaism. So I just want to point out the opening lines to it. It says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. So these uh, lines from the Nicene Creed are almost a direct quotation from 1 Corinthians 8, 6, which says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Yeshua, Messiah, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So many scholars consider this early liturgy of the Yeshua following community, and those scholars and others uh, suggest that this is a Yeshua-infused uh, Shema um, and a universalized Shema. And I want to connect it to Zechariah 14, 9, which says, And the Lord will become king over all the earth. On that day the Lord will be one, and his name one. So this Tanakh itself contains a universalized Shema. So I think Paul not only has Deuteronomy 6, 4 in mind, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, but I think even more primarily, Zechariah 14, 9, because of the universal focus of it um, with, while containing uh, the oneness of, of God. And so, of course, preceding Zechariah is Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Shema itself. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, which is an Israel-centric Shema, which is a pledge of allegiance Israel has uh, demonstrating its covenant commitment to God and God's covenant commitment to Israel uniquely. So while Zechariah and 1 Corinthians 8 uh, talk about this universal reality of all the nations of the world also worshiping God uh, through the Messiah we see in 1 Corinthians 8, Deuteronomy 6.4 is talking about Israel's unique covenant relationship and presumes that these two ideas are compatible, that Israel remains God's covenant uh, chosen people uniquely, while also all the nations of the world coming to worship uh, the same God. <coughs> and so going back to the Nicene Creed, their very opening line is, I believe in one God, and then I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. So in Messian Judaism, we believe God shares through his holy scripture two fundamental claims. One, that Yeshua is Lord and Messiah, and two, that Israel are his chosen people, called to be distinct from the nations. And so, in partnership with the Christian church, these two claims are asserted every week by the Messiah-following community. Every week, Messianic Jewish synagogues all over the world recite the Shema, the fundamental covenantal pledge between God and the people of Israel. And the Christian church recites the Nicene Creed, which asserts Yeshua is Lord and Messiah. And these are the two fundamental claims of the biblical text according to us. But not only does the Nicene Creed and the church assert Yeshua is Lord and Messiah, but it begins this assertion by alluding directly to Paul's universalized Shema, which is based on Zechariah's universalized Shema, which derives from the Israel-specific Shema of Deuteronomy 6.4. So when we recite the Shema, and the Christian church recites the Nicene Creed, we reciprocally affirm the other claim as well. Our recitation of Deuteronomy 6.4 points forward 
to 1 Corinthians 8, 6, which claims Yeshua is Lord. And their recitation of 1 Corinthians 8, 6 points back to Deuteronomy 6, 4, that God is in covenant with the people of Israel. Whether they're aware of that or not, that is what they're doing. I think this is a powerful example of how the complementary relationship between the church and Messianic Judaism gives God glory. I think it's a very beautiful, beautiful thing. And so while we're considering Yeshua's uh, incarnation and uh, the ecclesia, or the wider body of Messiah, the church, and the Messianic Jewish community, uh, I think that the ecclesia can reflect Yeshua's nature. Yeshua is one person with two natures, divine and human. His two natures are united, yet distinct. If you separate the two natures too much, the unity is lost. If you intermix the two natures too much, the two natures are lost. The ecclesia is one body with two communities, Israel and the nations. We are united, yet distinct. So the partnership of the church and Messianic Judaism can illustrate the incarnation in this way. For Yeshua to be Yeshua, he must have both his natures. For the ecclesia to be the ecclesia, it must have both its communities. Yeshua being one person with two distinct united natures, human and divine, is necessary because in order for him to have the power to legitimately forgive all of our sins, he must be fully God. And for him to genuinely bear all of our sins, he must be fully human. If the natures are not united, Yeshua is more than one person, which that doesn't work. If they are not distinct, they merge into some third different thing, which doesn't work. So it goes with the ecclesia. The ecclesia must have two distinct, united communities, Israel and the nations. If we are not united, it seems the Messiah is for Israel only, or is for the nations only which is certainly the impression that the Jewish community has now, is that Jesus is only for Gentiles. If we are not distinct, then it is not noticeable that the Messiah is the Messiah of Israel and the nations. It must visibly contain Israel to show that the Messiah is the Messiah of Israel, and it must visibly contain the nations to show that the Messiah is also the Messiah of the whole world. So the church representing the nations and Messianic Judaism representing Israel in the one ecclesia. All right, so getting back to the point of uh, talking about the Council of Nicaea, uh, the church has successfully articulated and defended who God is for millennia. And we have inherited the fruits of their incredible labor. So for this, we should be immensely grateful for the church, for uh, defending and articulating who Yeshua is and who God is uh, against uh, its objectors. And so uh, that concludes this week. Next week, we'll talk about uh, post-supersessionist theology. And so again, this is all to make the broad point that while the church is imperfect and has made tragic mistakes, we should appreciate the church for upholding the Tanakh and whole New Testament as scripture, for defending the deity of Yeshua for millennia, and working on correcting replacement theology. So thanks uh, for sticking around, everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come up uh, to me and ask them. And again, uh, give me your email if you want videos of this as well. So thank you.